In this section, we're going to talk about the most famous name in urbanism. If there's one urbanist that we all know, it's Jane Jacobs. Without a doubt, Jane Jacobs has had the biggest impact on the urban planning and adjacent fields related to cities from the last 60 years. I, like many of you, were exposed to her work, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and felt changed by the experience. It was inspiring not only because of her way of writing, but also because of her ability to connect with other people in the city who are not specialists in urbanism fields. Jane Jacobs herself was not a proper urbanist by our definition. She had no formal training, and yet she is widely considered the most knowledgeable expert on human behavior, especially in public spaces. I'm sure if you look at your bookshelf, Jane Jacobs is there. And indeed, she is one of the 19% of female authors in the subject that I refer to and love and hold in great esteem within urbanism. One of Jane's most influential quotes is, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. Everybody probably knows of this quote, but what does it actually mean? I think it's helpful for us to take a step back and think about Jane Jacobs, her work, her legacy, her incentive, and her impact through this lens of gender equity in our urban environments. I want you to stop for a minute and think of the most powerful man you know. Somebody who has influenced the places around you, maybe your personal life, maybe the country itself. Somebody who has gotten to where they are by sheer grace of goodness and now has control over some part of your life as a citizen. Now imagine that person was not elected. Imagine that person somehow arrived in that position and was not held accountable for their actions as they carried out whatever it is that they wanted to do. And then imagine a woman, someone who decided to stand up against that behemoth, put their foot down and say no. I'm talking of course about the story of Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses. It's fairly well known and the general storyline is understood, but I think that we do a disservice in representing this as simply a David and Goliath story and instead should think of it as a gender story. If Jane Jacobs had been another man, we may not actually be talking about it in the same way that we are today. And again, it's incredibly important to understand that one of the most influential works of literature in urbanism was in fact written by a woman. I think this is a fact that we don't celebrate often enough, and so I'd like to revisit this story through this lens at this time. Robert Moses was very influential because of his position in society. Much like the god kings of old, he put himself in a position of power and had around him a team of individuals that respected his opinion. His relationship to other individuals in power above him also prevented him from being punished for his actions. Because of this, Robert Moses thought of the city as a plaything, as something that he could look down to from above and negotiate at his own whim. That kind of machismo or bravado and an understanding that you yourself can be an expert in this position is pretty absurd. I think we can all understand that this kind of power should not be left to one individual when it comes to a city, especially one as complex as New York City. But it wasn't until this exact event that we really truly understood the kind of power that some people could wield to the detriment of others. The most famous of his projects was the Crosstown Expressway. This was a proposal to run a highway through Lower Manhattan. And this is where Jane Jacobs became greatly involved in urbanism beyond what she had written before. As a citizen in a lively neighborhood in Manhattan, Jane Jacobs had already done observations of different kinds of subcultures, much in the same way that an anthropologist looks at cultures today. Through these observations, she understood what it means to have a vital neighborhood what it means to have social cohesion, to know your neighbors, and to have a sense of ownership over the built environment from that grassroots perspective. At the time, the modern construct of a highway was seen as innovative, 
It was a peak of efficiency. It was something modern to be lauded, and any kind of destruction that went with it was for the betterment of the good. The era of the car was the dominant idea of an urban environment. There was an understanding that more space had to be taken up for cars to have a more efficient experience in the city. Still comparatively new, highways were seen as innovative. An expressway through the city would be efficient, the most direct route from A to B. Robert Moses did not care that this highway would have destroyed neighborhoods. He did not mind that it would have completely done away with a thriving neighborhood park. Jane Jacobs' experience on the ground gave her an understanding of that kind of community nature that a city really needs to have to thrive, and she was able to position this argument in a very specific way. Washington Square Park at the time did have a road going through it. Jane Jacobs latched onto this idea of taking away cars from a park that was really seen as a vital play space for the neighborhood's children. As she mostly walked and biked throughout the city, she again intrinsically, without professional education or anything of the sort, understand the human nature on the ground, face to face, at that slower speed. Jane saw the value of arguing for this important public space on behalf of vulnerable populations around it. When they were protesting, they decided to feature children in that protest as major users of this park in particular. Jane coordinated the protests of local women, especially mothers, to bring out buggies and to invite their children along to play games and have exercises demonstrating the potential and importance of this park in particular. And Jane Jacobs was incredibly adept at getting cameras out in front of these problems. Unfortunately, this project did go through in other parts of New York City, especially in disadvantaged neighborhoods that were unable to have the same kind of impact on their protests. These neighborhoods in the Bronx were not spared destruction, and the expressway was built, like in many other cities, completely dividing neighborhoods and separating vulnerable populations from necessary city services. This kind of segregation was forced upon neighborhoods, especially of people of color, for decades, without any kind of engagement, without any kind of understanding of the community's needs or voice or preferences, these projects were pushed through by people like Robert Moses and others in other cities across the country. But the work that Jane did to prevent Washington Square Park and Lower Manhattan from having the same fate is still incredibly important. And it was her qualitative experience of looking at people in the city that allowed that to happen. She was no doubt influenced by her friend Margaret Mead, an anthropologist at the time who focused on cultural areas in Southeast Asia. Margaret Mead is a huge inspiration to me as a contemporary to Jane Jacobs, in part because she's an anthropologist, but also because of her sheer determination to make things better for everyone. One of Margaret Mead's most famous quotes was, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Jane's influence went on to include her new home of Toronto in Canada, where she also stopped a highway from happening in her neighborhood. You can still see the memorial today where the construction had already started and yet she was able to change the minds of the people in power there too. Today, Washington Square Park is a thriving neighborhood public space. It has all of the elements of a good public space, water features, places to sit, a diversity of locations out in front and tucked away, and it still even acts as a place for protest today. This protest in particular was actually for Vision Zero, in the last few years in New York City. I don't think that it's a stretch to say that this kind of protest and advocacy towards zero pedestrian deaths on our street can be directly correlated to Jane Jacobs' focus and intense ferocity for people first in our urban environments. But going back to that Jane Jacobs quote, I want to give you another one. 
This one to me is my absolute favorite. I think it really speaks to her qualitative experience on the ground, but also I think it speaks more to her ideology and the reason behind the kind of work she was doing at the time. You can't prescribe decently for something you hate. It will always come out wrong. You can't prescribe decently for something you despair in. If you despair in humankind, you're not going to have good policies for nurturing human beings. I think people ought to give prescriptions who have ideas for improving things, ought to concentrate on the things that they love and that they want to nurture. In this way, Jane Jacobs is not only standing up against Robert Moses and his top-down development that has no consideration of the impact of the lives of the people on the ground, but Jane Jacobs is speaking aspirationally about us as a collective species and our place in these cities that we have built for ourselves and for each other. Jane Jacobs truly loved her city, but she really loved the people that lived around there with her. She understood that you needed that kind of compassion for other people in order to be successful. This was what Robert Moses did not have, that compassion for the other people around him in that city that he shared with a lot of other people. We'll talk a little bit more about that at a later course, but for now, we're going to follow up this section with some examples of other women that have taken this ideal to heart. Women who have understood what Jane Jacobs was about, the work that she was really doing on the ground, and how to bring that into the contemporary city.